Open your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians 5. <clears throat> and once more, let's pray. Father, I know that I cannot do what I'm about to do without your help. Lord, I can stand up here and give a talk, but there will be no power in it if your spirit does not fill me, Lord. So I pray that you would fill me with your spirit and help me to preach your word faithfully. And Lord, I pray that you would do what you say you will do and you will send your word forth and it will accomplish all that it sets out to do. It will not return void. Work in our hearts today. Lord, your word is sharper than any two-edged sword and it, uh, it divides our heart. It does surgery on our hearts. So I pray that it would do that very thing this morning. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, The act of preaching has been defined by someone um, as disturbing the comfortable and comforting the disturbed. And that's really what I aim to do every week when I stand here is those who are comfortable and don't want to move, I want to prod to try and get disturbed and a little uncomfortable and so that they'll repent and press forward to um, new places of, of obedience. And those who are disturbed be it by grief or sorrow or worry or weariness or whatever, I I want to comfort with the assurance that God loves them. Jesus did this. John 1.14, it says that when he came, he was full of grace and truth. He was full of both grace and truth. He spoke the truth to those who needed to hear it. He gave grace to those who needed it. He did not preach truth apart from grace, and he did not give grace devoid of truth. He did both together. So two weeks ago when I was preaching, I told you that at the beginning of my sermon that I might end up preaching only half my sermon that day, and that is exactly what happened. Um, Two weeks ago, we were looking at verses 12 through 15. We didn't get to verses 14 and 15, so that's what we're going to do today, Um, specifically dealing with the words that he says to um, the the people in the church here. So um, I'm going to read chapter 5, verses 14 and 15 of 1 Thessalonians. And we urge you, brothers, admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with them all. See that no one repays anyone evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another and to everyone. So my job and aim is to always preach the gospel. That does not mean just doing what you might imagine a traveling evangelist doing. Um, You know, just always say, you're you're going to hell and you need to get saved. I do that, and I need to do that, but uh, I'm always going to preach the gospel and and preach that you need Jesus and apply it to specific circumstances in your life. The gospel message is this, as we have heard three people profess this morning, that God created the world perfect and beautiful— Everything was supposed to always be good, and no evil, death, suffering, or sin would be present. But we decided we didn't want that. We wanted to go our own way. We thought God was keeping something from us, so Adam and Eve ate of the tree they were not supposed to, and each of us since has continued to disobey and go against the good plans that God has for our lives. We think we know better, and God has every right to judge and destroy us now, but he loves us. So God took on human flesh and was born. He lived as a human. He never sinned. He died on the cross taking the punishment for our sins so that, we, so that they could be paid for. And he rose from the dead, leaving suffering and death in the grave with him. So that now if you'll repent of your sins and believe in the death and resurrection of Jesus on your behalf, you'll be united to Christ, you'll be forgiven, and you'll be transformed. So that now the resurrected Christ controls every aspect of your life. There is so much tied up in that message, so many facets of it to apply to various parts of our lives. So when I preach, I aim to do that, to weekly remind you of what Christ has done for you, and then take the different facets of what he has done and apply it to life circumstances, to disturb the comfortable and comfort the the disturbed. 
So as we continue 1 Thessalonians, that's what my aim today is to do. These four or five groups that are mentioned, um, it, it, it uses the word admonish to the idol. It, you remember it's been connected back to verse 12, where it's talking about the pastor's job, um, where, where we said that is the preaching ministry of the pastors, to admonish you. Um, they're over you in the Lord. They're to admonish you. Um, so these kinds of things are what we should be doing, is what I should be doing, and also what, what sh we should be doing to one another. Notice there are verbs given, verses 14 and 15. There are verbs given of what to do to different groups. Um, uh, encourage, uh, admonish, help, be patient. Um, and then there's a group given for each of those verbs to go toward. And it must be noted, we don't, do the, we, we don't take those verbs and do it to the wrong group. So you never admonish the faint-hearted. You never encourage the idle. You you, you do the verb that's applied to that group of people. So allow me as your pastor to, speech to, each, to speak to each of these groups now. So first of all, to the idol. It says admonish the idol. Here's the deal. Idleness doesn't necessarily mean not working. It could mean not working, but it could also mean working a lot on all the wrong things, avoiding the things that actually matter. Example, a father is, he's, he's working overtime every week so that his kids can, quote, unquote, have a better life than he ever dreamed of as a kid. That's the stereotype. But he's never interacting with his family. He's getting home after his kids are in bed, and he's leaving the house in the morning before they're up. And he, he imagines he's um, giving them a better life than he ever dreamed of as a kid, but his kids will never have a good life if their dad is never there. It doesn't matter how many toys he can buy them. They need their dad. That is idleness. It's working hard, but it's giving your life to something that doesn't matter. All of us are tempted to idleness, especially spiritual idleness. We're tempted to spiritual idleness in some form or another. It might be simply, it might be simply not working, being lazy, but you could be completely mobile and be idle. Spiritual idleness can come in many forms. It might be people who don't serve in the church in any way. They are very involved in the things of this world, very active and mobile, but giving all their time to the wrong things. It might be someone who's giving no thought to their own spiritual life. They're content with the fact that they never read their Bibles. They pray very little. They do not want the things of God. They do not want to grow. It might be someone who is not active in the Great Commission um, to be making disciples of all the nations, baptizing them and teaching them the things Jesus has commanded. We're to go and we're to reach the lost and then we're to integrate them into the church and begin to teach them the things that Jesus has taught us. Um, they give no thought to any of these. An, an idle person will do that. The, we'll, we'll save that for the preachers and the missionaries. That's what they get paid for. It might be troublemakers in a church. 2 Timothy 3, 6 through 9. For among, you, uh, for among them are those who creep into households and capture weak women, burdened with sins and led astray by various passions, always learning and never able to arrive at knowledge of the truth. Just as Janus and Jan Jambres opposed Moses, so these men also oppose the truth, men corrupted in mind and disqualified regarding their, the faith. But they will not get very far, for their folly will be plain to all as was to those two men. It, it might be someone who is um, very active in a church, but they're, they're just there to troublemake. This happens in a lot of churches. They're just there to cause division. It, it's, it, they care very in, they're, they're very involved in the church, and they would say they even care about the church, but they're just causing trouble in the church. It's being focused. Idleness is being focused on things that don't matter and neglecting the things that do matter. So I ask you, are you idle? Is there somewhere in your spiritual life that you're idle? Well, to the idle, I'll do what the passage says. I'll admonish you. I want to warn you. Idleness is destructive to you because God is always working. He is always on the move. He is an active God that wants to see his kingdom come on earth, and he uses you and I to do that very thing. If you refuse to do so, you're giving your life to something that doesn't matter. You're wasting your life. Why would you ever want to do such a thing? I know you don't want to. Everybody wants their life to matter for something, to count for something. And Jesus died and rose again to give you something for your life to matter about. 
You don't have to put your focus on the things of this world anymore. There is a risen king who has given a commission for his people to go make disciples of all the nations. This is what each Christian's mission should be. So put forth all your energy into that. God's kingdom will never come to an end. But we give so much of our time and lives here on this earth to things that aren't eternal. They're going to burn up. They're going to end up in a trash heap or a garage sale. They are going to end up in a burn pile. They are not going to last. Yet we give so much of our energy to those things. May we be vigilant to build his kingdom in reaching the lost, in mentoring the next generation, in helping the poor and serving the shut-ins and loving children. Um, we, we do those things. Don't waste your life accumulating treasures on this earth when you could be building his kingdom that will last forever. So admonish the idle and then encourage the faint-hearted. Encourage the faint-hearted. Are you faint-hearted this morning? Don't, don't know what that looks like for you. Maybe you feel overworked in life, in the church, and in, in your family. Maybe you're in a really hard season of taking care of an aging parent. Maybe you're in a hard season of um, taking care of um, a, a disabled sibling. I, I don't know, but, but maybe you feel overworked. Maybe you're discouraged about something in your life. Maybe you're doubting God's goodness in light of what's going on in your life. Maybe you're fearful of the future. You see the world around us and you fear for either yourself or your kids and grandkids. Maybe you're anxious. Something's hanging over your life and you just don't see any way forward. Whatever it is, you can be encouraged this morning in the midst of that. Encouraged, the word literally means to give courage, to build up, to strengthen. In any moment of being faint-hearted, I've learned you must preach the gospel to yourself. You must remind yourself that Jesus lived and died and rose again and ascended on your behalf. That's not just your ticket into heaven one day, it is. That is also your hope and foundation for life right now. Are you overworked? Well, I would ask you a diagnostic question. Are you trying to prove yourself? I got to do more and more to prove myself. I got to do more and more to make sure God is happy with me. He has ascended. And sat at the right hand of the Father, his work is complete for you. You don't have to prove yourself anymore. God is completely happy with you forever because of what Jesus has done for you. But maybe it's a hard season of life right now, and you're just faint-hearted because of that. Well, Matthew eleven twenty-eight, Come to me, all who, are, who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He reigns. He can give you strength for your need. You, he, he can be your strength. You have to come to him. Are you discouraged? Discouraged because of something going on in life? What great news you have that Jesus has risen above the grave on your behalf. Whatever it is that's discouraging you, it has no eternal hold on you. You're going to live in the current moment you're in, but you're not going to live in that state forever. You will be released from the current moment that you're in, either in this life or in the next. You will be released from the curse that is on the world and obtain what Scripture calls the freedom of the glory of the sons of God. Jesus rose to defeat all the enemies of your soul, including those currently seeking to bring you down. Are you doubting God's goodness? Look at the cross. And look at the empty tomb. See Jesus dead and raised on your behalf. Is there any question that God is good when he's given his own son for us? Are you fearful of the future? Like, are you fearful for what the next 10 years is going to look like? Listen, you were made for this moment in history. God knew what he was doing before he made the universe, making you for this very moment. Are you fearful for your kids or your grandkids in the future? Don't be. They were made for this moment in history. God knew exactly what he was doing, having Haddon Fraser be born in 2020 and Ezra Fraser be born in 2023. He put them there, having a plan to use them in however history played out. And the risen Jesus will give them exactly what they need each day to survive and thrive in the day in history they find themselves. And he will for you too. He's faithful today as he was in 1965 and 1840 and 1712 and 1611 and all the times before. Jesus reigns on his throne. Don't let little things here on this earth cause you to fear. They are small things in the grand scheme of eternity.
In the grand scheme of eternity, the problems of 2024 are not even a drop in a bucket. He has carried his people through thousands of years of war and uprising and chaos and wickedness. He will continue to be faithful every day. However you're faint-hearted this morning, allow the glory of the gospel to breathe courage into you. To the weak, admonish the idle, encourage the weak, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak. It, it goes in a little bit with the previous command to encourage the faint-hearted, but um, could be speaking here of physical weakness or spiritual weakness. Um, physically weak, those who are frail uh, physically, maybe in age, maybe in disease, maybe in disability, and then spiritually weak, maybe someone struggling with sin, maybe someone struggling to understand God's will, someone doubting God's goodness or existence, someone with a weak conscience. What, what is the word to them? Well, the ESV says, says help them, um, I really like how the New Living Translation puts this verse. It says, take tender care of the weak. It's the Greek word, hold fast. Hold fast the weak. Grab a hold of them and make sure they don't fall. Much of my work as a pastor is doing this very thing, taking care of people who are weak. Not weak in a demeaning sense, but just weak in life. Something has them down. You should be free to come to me if, if you're beset with weakness. I usually know about your physical weakness. I don't always know about your emotional or spiritual weakness. God has given you a pastor to care for you in your weaknesses. So why are you not seeking out help in your weakness? Well, it could be a pride issue. You know, I can handle it myself. No, you can't. How are you doing with that? The Bible clearly says you need other people to help. It's, maybe you say it's not really that big of a deal, but you know that's not true. You're drowning in it. It's all you think about. It's eating you alive. When are you going to snap out of it? Get some help. Remember Psalm 23. The, Lord's, the Lord is my shepherd, and he shepherds me in life. And he does that often through under-shepherds. So come talk to me if you need help in a weakness that you're in right now. And then finally, final group of people, to all. So we've dealt with the idle, we've dealt with the faint-hearted, we've dealt with the weak, and we've, now we're dealing with all. Uh, maybe you're not idle or faint-hearted or weak, so I guess this sermon isn't for you. No, he then speaks to all people in verse 15. Um, the final command, be patient with them all, ties in with verse 15. That's why I didn't specifically address that. Um, it ties in with verse 15. Verse 15 would be the verse to all of the congregation because it's so needed in the day and age they live in and the day and age we live in. See that no one repays anyone evil for evil, but always seek to do good to the one, to one another and to everyone. Maybe one of the most prominent values of our day and time is repay evil with evil. Kids are told if someone hits you, you turn around and hit them back. And adults spend so much time fighting people they disagree with, especially in the political climate of our day. You hate and oppose every word your opponent says. Tear them down in every way possible. Don't listen to them, just fight. I read a book a few weeks ago that was a memoir of a woman that grew up in western Kentucky. And me being from western Kentucky, I found it interesting to read it, so I read it. And um, when she was 12 years old, she was abused by her VBS teacher. And it happens multiple times. She never told anyone because her abuser, as they often do, manipulated her to keep it quiet. She finally started sharing her story as an adult, and it was around the time that the hashtag MeToo movement happened, and there was a lot of political conflict around that. And uh, she started sharing that in her church. She was a member of a church. And rather than embracing her and grieving with her, most of the Christians she knew maligned her for it. You're a liberal communist Marxist. That, that's not okay. That we would meet people in their suffering by turning them into political enemies. That shows that we follow the elephant or the donkey a lot more than we follow the lamb. Jesus had a different message for his followers, a far different message. You know this message, Matthew 5, verses 38 through 47. You have heard that it was said... An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him also the other. And if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. 
And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who begs from you, and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. You've heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good. He sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even tax collectors do the same? If you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? Love your enemies. That is radically countercultural to the time Paul and Jesus said this, and it's radically countercultural today. Understand, Jesus isn't just teaching there to let people walk all over you. No, he's saying that when people do walk all over you, love them rather than retaliating. Remember, Jesus did not attack the people who attacked him. He did not call down angels to kill the soldiers arresting him. He could have, but he didn't. He did not, you know, absorb all kinds of heavenly power and blow the roof off the courtyard when they were flogging him. He could have done that, but he didn't. He did not hit back when the soldiers smacked him. He did not insult those who insulted him. He did not spit on those who spit on him. He stretched out his arms... They nailed him to the cross, they lifted him up, and the Son of God was on display in all his glory. Not in defeat, not in humiliation, that was not what the cross was ultimately about. This, was, this is what our God is like in all of his glory. Our God allowed himself to die under his own judgment rather than kill his enemies. He hung on the cross crying out, forgive them. He hung on the cross telling John to take care of his mother. He hung on the cross pardoning the sin of the thief that had been previously mocking him. He hung on the cross fully enduring God's wrath for our sin and after taking it all in himself crying out, It is finished. His love displayed to the entire universe. This is what our God is like. He loves He redeems, he cleanses, he makes new, he restores. And this is the God we seek to reflect to the world. We live in the spirit of this God to the world around us. We find ways to bless rather than attack them. We seek to do good. Paul says, to one another and to everyone. One another is a common phrase used for the fellowship between believers. So he's talking there. We, we do good to other Christians in the church and then to everyone, to people outside the church. You just need to know, this room right now is full of sinners and I'm one of them. We're all going to do evil to each other at some point, whether we intend to or not. And when that happens, we must be ready to do good to each other in return to love, to forgive, to bless, to pray for each other. And the same is true for the outside world. They're going to hurt us. They're going to do evil to us. We, We must be ready to love and forgive and bless and pray for those people. What a countercultural witness to the world that would be. Yet Christians rarely practice it. Don't repay no one evil for, let no one repay anyone evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another and to everyone. This is the gospel, and it's the gospel applied to our lives. It's applied to the idle, it's, it's applied to the faint-hearted and the weak, and to all of us in a day where we want to do nothing but do evil to others, because they did evil first. But the gospel is the good news that Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ has ascended, Christ will come again. And this is the hope of the world. It saves sinners, it reconciles people at odds with each other, it redeems broken families, it purifies churches, it humbles proud people, it gives joy to the depressed, it makes the most hard-hearted person start to be nudged a little bit. So I ask you, how does the gospel fall on you today? How are you going to respond to it? Are you not saved? Do you not know Jesus? Well, would you like to have the eternal joy that the gospel gives? Do you see in your heart that Jesus is all satisfying, that he is your only hope? Then come to him. Repent of your sins 
and believe Jesus died and rose again on your behalf and surrender your life to him? Are you idle? What are you making your life about? Don't you realize there's something more grand? It's called the gospel. Surrender to it and make that what your life is about. Are you faint-hearted or weak? Take courage this morning. Jesus is risen on your behalf. He is interceding to his Father for you always. He's holding you in this moment of weakness that you're in. And he supplies you strength for it. Is there some other way the gospel strikes you this morning? How is the Holy Spirit working in you today? Because God is always working. I'm confident he's nudging you somehow. Now's the time to respond. We're going to have a response time here after I pray. We're going to sing a song that, um, that, that we've sang before. It's going to be on the screens. It's, it's a hymn, not in the hymnal. Um, but but, but I just, we're going to sing it. And I want you to take this time to respond. Respond to how the Lord is speaking to you. Do not reject him. Come. Let's pray. Father, I pray that we would have the gospel wash over our souls this morning. It is exactly what we need, the truth of the scriptures, the truth that Jesus is dead and risen for us. So, Lord, may that apply to each circumstance of our life, whether we're idle or faint-hearted or weak or impatient or um, doing evil to evil. Lord, wherever we're at, Lord, may the gospel pry us away from it and on to better obedience, better courage, better love. I pray for people here today, Lord, and I pray that you would move in them, move in me, and may the gospel reshape every part of our lives. Thank you, Lord, that you are dead and risen for us, and you're interceding at the right hand of the Father right now for us, and always doing that. Who are we that we would be deserving of that? We are not. We just have a God that is good, and we pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen.